Well, good morning. I am so very thankful to be here to talk about prayer. And prayer is truly an amazing opportunity we have to come before God and commune with Him, spend time with Him, spend time in relationship with Him. But many of us, um, you know, I want to I begin this morning by thinking, how do we approach prayer? How do we approach God as we pray? And as I've been thinking about this this past week, you know, I've thought of my own life, and quite often I'm approaching prayer and I'm approaching God in prayer kind of like I'm walking up to a vending machine. I'll pull the coins out of my pocket, I'll plug the coins in to the machine, and I'll hit B7 hoping to get a Snickers bar, and, and I'm upset when I don't get what I want. You know what? If I press B7 and I get a Three Musketeers instead of a Snickers, it's kind of upsetting. Because I'm approaching the vending machine, and I want the vending machine to give me what I want. A lot of us approach prayer in this same way, this vending, ma- vending machine mentality, this cosmic vending machine in the sky that we can approach with our little handful of coins and we can plop our coins into the vending machine of prayer and we can hit B7 saying, you know what, God, I put my coins in so I deserve my request. I requested a Snickers, B7, and you answered me in the wrong way. Many of us approach prayer in this kind of posture, in this kind of way, that God is some sort of cosmic vending machine that will give us what we want. The problem with that thinking or that theology is we're at the center of the universe there. Life is all about us and what we want. And many of us, this is our prayer life myself included. I'll be flat out honest with you. There are, there are a lot of prayers that I pray during a given day, and if I really assess them, these prayers are very selfish in nature. These prayers are prayers of saying, here is what I want. God, if I give you my little coins, will you answer me? Honestly, we have nothing we can bring to God except our brokenness. We come before him and say, you know what, I have nothing. Even my coins are worth nothing. All that I have is worth nothing. But when we come to God in prayer, it shouldn't be as though we are approaching a vending machine hoping to get what we want, but as a, almost a crazy jump into a mud bath, a And imagine the mud bath as God's presence or God's grace or God's love for us. If I were right now to jump into a swimming pool full of mud and walk up here dripping in mud or walking through the doors dripping in mud, everything I would come in contact with would would somehow be stained with that mud. Now imagine instead of this cosmic vending machine theology, Imagine that we're taking this mud bath theology saying, you know what, every morning I'm going to wake up, I'm going to immerse myself in the character, presence, and nature of who God is. I'm going to let who God is shape how I live my everyday life. And I'm going to approach prayer with reverence and awe and at the same time almost a reckless abandon. I'm going to surrender myself to all that God has I'm going to jump headlong into this mud bath. I'm going to let who God is just ooze out of me more and more day by day. So we've got this vending machine mentality, and then we've got this being bathed in mud, almost like a pig wallowing in mud, just savoring the goodness of God, letting that soak into our pores, letting that soak into our very being. And from that place of realizing his grace in his presence 
and his love, letting that shape how I pray. Now, I have been praying for a very long time. I grew up going to church. I started going to church when I was two weeks old, and prayer was a part of our house. Prayer was a part of the school I went to. Prayer was a part of the church that I went to. And there were prayer meetings happening all the time. So I grew up in this atmosphere of prayer, but always treating it as I'm going to ask God for what I want. Instead of saying, you know what? I'm going to just surrender myself to what God would have for me. I did not even know that God was going to answer a prayer that I prayed by placing me here with you guys as a part of Lakeside. And I honestly did not know that Lakeside existed. But God in all his wisdom did, and he placed us together for a time. And I am so very thankful for that. That shows how faithful God is. God has a grander vision for our lives than we do. And he has a grander purpose for our lives than we do. And the passages that I want to soak in today are profound. The first passage we're going to be looking at, I want us to ponder who God is and what God has done. Because who God is and what God has done should shape our lives. And then, once we soak in the goodness, we're not just created to soak in the goodness and just ponder for the rest of our lives. The reason we ponder the glory of God in prayer is so that we can proclaim the glory of God to the ends of the earth. And that is through relationships with people, but it is also through worship, through proclaiming his, his name. His name is worthy that we're just singing about. His name is worthy of all names. His name is high above all names. So the first thought I want us to think about is in, in place of the cosmic vending machine prayers, my hope in prayer is that as we walk out of here, we all approach prayer with, with a wide-eyed wonder as a little kid looking at a circus for the first time. You know, you're just going, wow, I have the opportunity to ponder what it is that God is up to. I am so excited to ponder what God is doing and what God is revealing of himself in his word. So, we're going to read uh, Psalm 145, and it says... I will extol you, my God and King, and bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you and praise your name forever and ever. Listen to this. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. Pause right there for a minute. Think about this. When we're praying, we're praying to a God who is great. It says, great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. His greatness is unsearchable. So when we're praying to a God, we're not praying to a God that has a small vision for our life. He is a great God that has a great vision for our lives and for this church. And he wants to see that uh, vision carried out through his church. This passage goes on to say, One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. So when God acts in a mighty way, we should be reminding each other of what we see God doing. In our family, we call this sharing evidence of God's grace. And when we come together and we pray, and we pray about the, the, the prayers that God has answered, it's just an evidence that he is awesome. And it says, one generation will commend your works toward, toward another and they shall declare your mighty acts. I love that verse and I studied this verse. I'm, it takes me a long time to understand things. So the way that I first understood this, this verse, uh, verse 4, 
was that older people are going to tell younger people how good God is. And I thought, that is awesome. And as I unpacked it and did some more study on that one verse, I realized that it says, one generation shall commend your works to another. It doesn't say older will commend your works to a younger. It says one generation will commend your works to another. It works both ways. Sometimes younger people share of what God has done, and someone that's a bit older is greatly encouraged. And so it's a two-way street. It goes on to say, on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wonderful, wor wondrous works, I will meditate. Now, if we're honest, do we meditate on God's wonderful works? More often than not, we're meditating on the problems of our life. <laughs> we're obsessed with the problems, with the trials, with the temptations, with the sin that so easily entangles us. We're not obsessed or overwhelmed or overjoyed and we're not meditating on the works of God. We're meditating on our problems. Now, our problems in comparison to the grandeur and grace of God, our problems are tiny and God's grace is huge. Quite often, though, we see it the other way around. We see our God as tiny and our problems as huge. I want you to ponder that thought for a minute and think and, and ask, ask the Lord to recalibrate your mind to see how grand he is and to see verse 5 come to reality that on your glorious splendor and on your majesty and on your wondrous works, I will meditate. If we could just do verse 5 and live that way, if we could just meditate on what God is doing, it would be amazing. Uh, this past week, I had an opportunity to talk with some people, and they said, how is it that you're always so positive? I'm like, oh, I'm not. First of all, I'm not. <laughs> Secondly, the reality is that when we fix our eyes on what we see God doing, and we fix our eyes on his faithfulness, and we fix our eyes on his steadfast love, we're going to be filled with hope. When we fix our eyes on the problems that are around us, like this person that I was talking with was doing, I'm like, man, that's depressing. That's a struggle if all you're ever focused on is the problem instead of the one who is the solution. It will be depressing. So I want to encourage all of us to meditate, to fix our eyes and our attentions on the wondrous works of God. God is at work in your life every single day. If you get to the end of the day, you could look back and say, wow, God showed up in a mighty and powerful way right here. And as we share those stories with one another, it reveals that God is alive, God is active, and God is on the move in our everyday lives. It goes on to say, they shall speak of your might, um, they shall speak of the might of your awesome deeds, and I will declare your greatness. They shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Are these the things that like, captivate our language in our everyday life? Are we just proclaiming what God is doing? Are we just overjoyed at, at the awesome deeds of God, and are we declaring his greatness? Imagine a life that looked like that. That's what I'm imagining for all of us this morning, that we would begin to live that kind of life. It says in verse 7, they shall pour forth the fame of your abundant goodness and shall sing aloud of your righteousness. Now, we, get, we have this high privilege on Sunday mornings of gathering together and worshiping God in song, but we have an opportunity in our everyday life to pour forth the goodness of God from our lips. In our conversations and in our relationships with people. Um, so the, this young lady that I was talking with that was asking me why I can stay so positive, 
I was able to say, you know what? I have received what Christ has done for me, and that allows me to live in a brand new way because my happiness is not dependent on my circumstance anymore. It is rock solid in who Christ is. My identity is safe and secure. I'm his child, and I get to live in a brand new way because of that reality. Uh, Verse 8 continues on. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Think about that. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He is pouring forth his grace and pouring forth his mercy. And boy, do we need it. Um, <laughs> it's, can I get an amen? <laughs> um, it is a reality that we all need his grace and mercy all the time. It goes on to say he's uh, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Steadfast love is a love that never fails. And this being slow to anger is so very good. It's so good that God is patient with us in our struggles with sin. He realizes our struggle with our sin, and he is lovingly patient with us. Uh, Keith Green, in a bunch of his songs, writes about the, pre- the, the patience of the Lord in relationship to our sin and it is an amazing reality that he is slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love we need that verse 9 goes on to say the lord is good to all and his mercy is over all he has made all your works shall give thanks to you O lord and all your saints shall bless you They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your mighty power to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. Your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his works and kind in all his in all his words, and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are falling and raises up all who are bowed down. There are moments in our lives where we are falling. There are moments where we are bowed down in humility before God. And those are good moments. When we're approaching God in a posture of of brokenness or in a posture of humility... That's the broken and contrite heart that Paul is talking about in Psalm 51. That is what the Lord desires. That's what he wants. He wants us to come not with our pocket full of coins to the vending machine, but just as his children saying, Lord, I come, I am in desperate need of you, Jesus. Help me right now. It goes on to say, the eyes of all look to you, And you give them their food in due season. You open your hand and you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Did you guys know that the Lord is your provider? Think about it. Okay, so imagine that a friend comes to you and they just lost their job. And they say, could you pray for me? First of all, most of us, I'm hoping, would say, yes, I'll pray for you. And most of us, what, what our prayer would be like is, Lord, provide a job for this person. And that's a great prayer, to pray for someone to be gainfully employed. That's awesome. But think about this. If we're praying from the posture of God being almighty, the first thing we should remind that person of in prayer is that God is their provider. And that God, in his time, will provide the exact right job in the right way. And so instead of just praying that they get a job, praying that they would realize that God is their provider is backing it up. I think both prayers are needed. I think, honestly, if someone needs a job, you should be praying for them to get a job. 
But first and foremost, you should be praying for them to know that God is their provider. And when God provides a job, you could praise God instead of praising you know, the employer. You could praise God for providing that job. Likewise, if someone comes to you and they're, they're sick or they're hurting and you pray for them to be healed, reminding them that God is the only one who can heal. God is our healer. Start there and then pray for their healing because when they're healed, they'll give praise to God. And that is an awesome uh, kind of progression to take. The passage goes on to say, The Lord is near to all who call on Him, to all who call on Him in truth. He fulfills the desires of all those who fear Him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love Him, but all the wicked He will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all the flesh and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Psalm 145 is one of my favorite psalms in the entire, uh, all, of all the 150 psalms. Because it reminds us who, of who God is. That his steadfast love endures. That his steadfast love is there for us when other people's love maybe isn't. God loves us right where we're at. And when we come before him and say, Lord, I desperately need you right now, those are some of the best prayers. Some of the best prayers are also when we're just at, the, at wit's end. We don't know what else to do, and we just scream out, help! That is an awesome prayer because it shows how weak we are how needy we are, and in that simple prayer of help, we're actually confessing that God is able to meet our need. So in one word, we're, we're confessing our weakness and his strength. And all prayer should be approached in that kind of posture. We do not bring anything to prayer other than our brokenness and our our, hum, our humanness, our, our human frailties. But not only do we get to ponder the reality in prayer of who God is and let that shape our prayer life, we get to proclaim who God is in prayer. Instead of just seeing prayer as something that we, we say words to God to get what we want, prayer is not about us. Prayer is about God. God is the center of the universe. We are not. And we get to proclaim these truths to the ends of the earth. Psalm 96 says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Bless His name. Tell of His salvation day after day. Declare His glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. When you look up at the heavens at night, it should remind you of how huge God is. How amazing He is in his strength and power to create the entire universe. It goes on to say, Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of His holiness. Tremble before Him all the earth. When we come before Him, we should come with a reverent awe and say, you know what, 
God, you have the power and you would be completely just to squash me like a grape right now. But God, in his mercy and in his grace, chooses not to squash us, but to love us. Look at verse 9 again. It says, worship the Lord in his splendor and holiness. He is completely holy. He has never failed, ever. Tremble before him. If he's never failed, we should tremble before him. And it says all the earth. All the earth should tremble before him. It goes on to say in verse 10, Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. So God is a God of justice. He will judge the peoples of the earth. But it is by his grace and mercy that we can have salvation, that we can be saved from our sins. And my hope and prayer is that as we approach prayer in the coming days, that we don't see prayer as the cosmic vending machine that I was talking about before, but that we see prayer as an opportunity to come before a holy and, a, and mighty God in our frailness and in our brokenness and say, Lord, I'm yours. Do whatever you would want to do in and through me for your good. This life is about you. I have died to myself. I no longer live for myself, but I live for Christ. And Christ is going to do his work through me as I go. So this posture of prayer, of coming and pondering the glorious goodness of who God is, and then proclaiming that, notice that style of prayer is not about us at all. We're pondering God, and we're then, after pondering God and soaking in who God is, we're proclaiming God. So we're, we're, we're receiving and we're giving out. It's not about us anymore. So when we pray these dangerous prayers of pondering God, God is going to give us an opportunity to proclaim who he is, to speak of his mighty deeds, to declare him among the nations, as both of these psalms talk about. That is an awesome privilege that we have. And this life is not about us. It's not about our wants, our needs, our desires. It's not about B7 and hoping you get a Snickers bar. It is not. It's about relentlessly and, and almost recklessly diving into the arms of our loving Savior and say, Lord, use me. Shape the, way, the very way I pray. May I pray, and in, in, when we pray together, may I, may I pray to the Lord, the glory do his name. May I proclaim who he is to the nations. Tomorrow night, we're going to get together for an hour of prayer. And I want to invite every single one of you to join us. And when we come together, it is an amazing opportunity. Last time, when we got together about a month ago, it was tangible, the work that God was doing. We cannot change ourselves. We cannot become more holy apart from God's work in us. So, like Brittany said, come, bring your struggles, bring your problems, but know that we are not going to focus on the problems. Bring them, be real. But when we come, we're going to realize the goodness of God who wants to transform whatever brokenness we bring him, he wants to heal. He wants to restore. He wants to do his redeeming work in our lives. And that is what I believe he'll do tomorrow night as we come together for one hour. Come together to lift our request before the Lord and let him do his mighty work to change us and transform us by his grace and by his mercy. So with that, let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for the power of your word. Lord, we thank you that so many of the Psalms declare who you are. Lord, throughout your word, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, Lord, it is a story about you. 
It's not about us. Lord, help us realize that as we approach you in prayer, we are your kids coming before you as our mighty and holy God. Lord, help us realize that we can come, crawl up into your lap. Lord, that you'll put your arms around us. That we can confess our brokenness to you. And Lord, in response, what we'll receive is your grace and mercy. Lord, I thank you so much for this time. Lord, I pray that we would ponder daily your goodness and that we wouldn't ponder and hoard that blessing um, for ourselves, that we, but from pondering we would turn to proclaiming, that we would ponder your goodness in prayer and that we would proclaim your goodness in prayer, that when people come to, come to us and say, could you pray for me, we would pray for their needs, but we would also remind them of how you meet their needs. Not how we meet their needs, but Lord, how you meet their needs. Lord, we thank you for your mighty and holy name, and we pray all this in your mighty and holy name. Amen.